Thanks very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Slavin. It's, uh, I've never been called a pregnancy expert before, um, so that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> though, uh, yes, that's true. I've written uh, a few articles on pregnancy, uh, but uh, that's, that's certainly not a, a focus of my, uh, my research. Uh, Chiari is, though, and I think the intersection between the two uh, is of interest. So again, Dr. Slevin, thank you for the the introduction, um, and uh, we really appreciate all of the work that you've put into organizing this this great meeting and hosting this great meeting. and And thanks also to the uh, the ASAP group uh, as a whole. I saw Eric and John in the back of the room. I think Patrice and Patricia are are in the hallway, and and uh, they put in a huge amount of work uh, organizing the society in general and the meeting in particular. Uh, every year, and and their work, I think, is is really very appreciated. This is a uh, a really important uh, group uh, in the Kiari and Syringomyelia community. Uh, there are other opportunities for surgeons and neurologists and scientists to go and, and present their research, uh, but this is really a very unique opportunity for us to come and interact with patients that are going through. Uh, many of these things and, and get ideas from them. And hopefully it's a two-way communication where we learn from each other. And uh, ASAP, I think, has a, a really truly unique uh, and important position in uh, the community for that reason. So thank you uh, all for your hard work. Um, again, as, as Dr. Slavin said, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about uh, Chiari and pregnancy. And uh, this is, a, I think, a relatively straightforward topic, but one that uh, I hope you will agree is worthy of our attention. There's four million babies born uh, in America every year. And then if you, if you do some basic math and you say, okay, well, a conservative estimate of Chiari prevalence in the childbearing age in women, uh, four million times 1% now, you've got 40,000 uh, women that have a Chiari that are giving birth in the United States every year. Most of them don't know they have a Chiari. So now again, conservative math, how many people have a Chiari diagnosis and give birth every year? Well, it's still multiple thousands of women that this would affect uh, every year. Uh, and I would argue, and I, I hope to show you, that that diagnosis, the Chiari diagnosis, is affecting uh, childbearing decisions, obstetrical decisions, and we'll explore whether or not that's, uh, that's justified or not. In my own practice, uh, I certainly see it a lot, uh, and that was partly what made me uh, interested in, in looking at this topic. Um, I'm not sure if this is a common feature of all surgical practices, but I know in my practice probably twice a month uh, I'm asked to see a patient uh, who has a Chiari diagnosis and who's going to deliver a baby, and I'm asked to provide instructions on what do they need to do for a, a safe uh, obstetrical experience. And uh, so I thought, okay, well, what's, what's the evidence here? What, what can I do? And it turns out there, there is very little evidence that's been published in the literature. So we were on our own. Um, last month, uh, I think a good example, I saw a woman who uh, was on her third pregnancy. And she has two children. Her first two children were delivered uh, by elective C-section under general anesthesia because she had a Chiari diet. And now she comes to me and she wants to know what to do with the third pregnancy. Turns out she's going to have a C-section because the obstetricians don't want to um, do a, a VBAC for, for her. But this is a woman who's, I, I would argue, her life has been very affected by that diagnosis. And again, today I hope to explore very briefly what the scientific basis for that practice is, if anything. Again, this, this is Edward Monk, obviously, the scream. And, and I think when you ask the obstetrical community, you know, what are you going to do about this woman? She has a Chiari diagnosis, and now she's going to deliver a baby. And this is the obstetrical community's reaction to this. They're really scared of this, okay? Um, and, and should they be? Uh, well, I, I don't really think so. I think in many cases they should be okay with this. You know, they, I think the proper obstetrical care for most women with Chiari is just proper obstetrical care for most women with or without the Chiari. And we'll look at some, some data for that. Here's the obstetrical literature. There's about 20, 25 case reports that have been published in the obstetrical literature on this topic. Notice I said case reports. 
We're not looking at, for, the, for the most part at l really large case series. We're not looking at vast experience, multi-center studies and so on. Here's case reports. Somebody thought it was worthy of a case report, even in recent years, to say, here's a woman with a Chiari malformation and she had a baby and everything was fine. Right? That doesn't seem reportable to me, but in the obstetrical literature, you can get published with this sort of thing. Slightly larger case series, seven patients, not very many, right? Probably not going to be of, of interest in the neurosurgical literature, although a very distinguished neurosurgeon, John Oro, is the senior author on this paper. But again, seven patients having a baby with a Chiari malformation, and this makes it into the obstetrical literature. Four epidurals, no problems. Slightly larger series now, 12 patients, 30 babies. Not very many epidurals. And again, I would argue that's because of the, the uh, fear in the obstetrical community. And again, no significant problems. One patient had a blood patch after an epidural, which is about the normal rate. And then more recently, uh, the largest series that had been in the literature is 21 patients over 14 years. This is an English series about the typical number of C-sections for that population. And again, uh, no complications. So that's the existing state of the literature. And based on that, again, can you, can you infer uh, that there should be a lot of fear uh, in the obstetrical community about uh, normal obstetrical practice? I would argue not. And yet here again, here's a recent review, Journal of Cl Clinical Neuroscience. It's got this really uh, interesting title, Determinants of Chiari Progression in Pregnancy. Um, so I, I read this article with interest. I was hoping they would be following a large number of Chiari patients and we would see who, if anybody, is actually progressing uh, with Chiari symptoms in pregnancy, as the, the title implies. But in fact, that's not what they do. It's a review article uh, summarizing some of the literature that I've shown you and then essentially stating their opinion, uh, not based on any fact of uh, what obstetrical practice should be, and, and I've highlighted some of it here. Mode of delivery, uh, they say uh, ce uh, cesarean section is the preferred mode of delivery, especially for symptomatic patients. Avoid Valsalva, avoid any pushing. Uh, and again, uh, no spinal block, epidural block, only with caution, and they say general anesthesia is preferred. Okay, so again, their opinion is that C-section general anesthesia is preferred not based on any data, just an opinion piece. So uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's quote here, everyone's entitled to his opinion, but not his own facts. So let's, let's look at some facts. Um, for this uh, particular project, we chose to use the Optum data set. There's lots of different large national data sets that are available now, uh, Truven and Optum and, and inpatient samples and so on. I like the Optum one uh, for this because it's longitudinal. It's not just based on one hospital admission. You can actually look at diagnoses that are made over time, over multiple different admissions. And it has the advantage of size. Um, you can see the right-hand column there, the numbers of millions of patients that are included in the data set on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, so for that reason, we chose to use Optum. Uh, the years that we studied, we had uh, almost 60 million patients that were included. Again, they weren't all included over the entire duration of the data set. And oops, let me go back. And from there, we can, we can see that we had 35,000 uh, uh, diagnoses of Chiari. We excluded Chiari 2 patients by excluding anybody with a myelomeningocele um, uh, code uh, that was included. Uh, and from that 33,000 now population, we found that we had just over 1,000 admissions resulting in a childbirth. So that's the, essentially the size of our data set. We wanted a comparison group, so we've got 1,000 or so Chiari patients that we studied. We decided to study 11,000 other admissions for childbirth that were matched for age and region and so on, but that didn't carry a Chiari diagnosis. So again, 12,000 people in the study, 1,000 with Chiari, and 11,000. Uh, without Chiari. And here's what we found. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, because of the, the matching that we did, the age of delivery is the same. Um, but you can see that um, the length of stay was not different. And that was true whether the diagnosis of Chiari was made before or after the pregnancy. In other words, no matter, this was not influenced by obstetrical decisions. The length of stay did not change. But what did change is the rate of cesarean sections, 
was higher, significantly so, in those that had a Chiari diagnosis made before their delivery. In other words, if the obstetrician knew that there was a Chiari diagnosis or had the ability to know because the diagnosis had been made, then you are statistically much more likely to have a C-section than those without. Same thing with epidural anesthetic. Those with the Chiari diagnosis prior to delivery were significantly less likely to have an epidural anesthetic than those who did, had the diagnosis afterwards. So in other words, it's not whether or not you had a Chiari or not, it's whether or not the diagnosis was made is leading to this. So this is physician behavior essentially that's driving that difference. You can see that over the life of our study, there were more and more women with Chiari delivering babies. And I would argue that this is not because uh, it's actually happening more frequently, but because we're diagnosing it much more often now, the rate of childbirth in women with Chiari just follows the rate of diagnosis of people with Chiari in general in the United States over the last 20 years. This is another one of our studies uh, from JNS, uh, I think published in, in uh, 2018. And, uh, and you can just see that in general, the rate of Chiari diagnosis over the last 20 years has increased very substantially, almost tripled. So why are more women with Chiari delivering babies? Well, because more people in the general population know that they have a Chiari diagnosis than in the past. So let's dive a little bit deeper. I told you that in our study, women with a Chiari diagnosis were much more likely to have a cesarean section than those without the Chiari diagnosis. And, and that's true, but it's, it's not simple. If you actually look at the trends over time on a year-by-year -year basis, it's actually kind of mixed up with or without the Chiari diagnosis in the early days, right? You can see that actually there's not much of a difference here in this early part of the graph. But then more recently, starting about 10 years ago, instead of the lines crossing over somewhat randomly, you can see that the lines are, are splitting and spreading apart. So I would argue that this reflects uh, what I think has been a change in obstetrical practice. Uh, I think obstetricians are much more aware of this and their practice has been changing uh, over the last decade. And, and again, perhaps not in a way uh, that's evidence-based, uh, but nevertheless one that, that you can see is picking up momentum. Same thing with neuroaxial analgesia for patients with Chiari malformation. You can see it's kind of mixed up there for a while. But just like with the cesarean practice, you can see that the lines are splitting. Uh, and so again, I would argue that uh, anesthetic practice in uh, women with pregnancies is changing uh, recently too. So that's all to show that if you have a Chiari diagnosis, your obstetrical decisions will be, at least statistically speaking, different than if you don't have a Chiari diagnosis. Is there any evidentiary basis to support these decisions? I mean, are we doing the right thing by recommending all sorts of different things for women with Chiari? And, and again, I would argue that in general, uh, the answer to that is not. This is back to this comparison group that I talked about, 1,048 women with Chiari and 11,000 uh, matched women uh, without Chiari. And we looked at all of the uh, possible pregnancy complications we could think of. And this is based on other similar studies in the obstetrical literature, looking at other comparison groups, but not for Chiari, heart disease, and so on. Um, so these are sort of the accepted morbidities of childbirth that I've listed here in the left-hand column. And they include lots of general problems, septicemia, eclampsia, anesthetic complications, and so on, but also stroke, cerebrovascular accident, um, and things that would be of interest to this group. Uh, in addition to that, we looked at length of stay. In addition to that, we look at discharge destination, who's going home, who's going to a uh, uh, you know, home with aid and so on. And here's the bottom line. Uh, there were no differences. There were just absolutely no differences. This is a large group and we couldn't find a single difference between those with Chiari delivering babies and those without Chiari delivering babies. Severe morbidity in childbirth is about 1%. And that's true whether you have a Chiari uh, or not. <clears throat> And again, just to summarize, one versus 1.3%. In fact, it's sort of just, a, I think, as a statistical accident, the Chiari is 1% morbidity. The, the controls, those without Chiari, was 1.3% morbidity. I'm not going to argue that Chiari was protective. That wasn't, 
that wasn't the case. But that, that fits very well if you look at the obstetrical literature and like what is the rate of morbidity in childhood in general. Lots of obstetrical papers on, on that. And again, same rate. It's about 1, 1.3% somewhere in that ballpark. So that's where we found our Chiari patients. That's where we found our control patients. And that's where other large obstetrical studies have also put the number. So it seems to be uh, uh, valid by those external resources. So just to conclude, women with Chiari are much more likely to have a C-section. They're much less likely to have an epidural. These trends, I would argue, are increasing over time. Um, there are low rates of maternal morbidity in this group, at least no higher than in any other group. Um, no evidence of substantially increased risk. So again, back to the monk painting. Um, in general, this is my stance again, twice a month, consultation, what should I do? I'm pregnant, I have a Chiari malformation. In general, this is my, my stance uh, with that particular question. Now, I will point out that there is an exception to every rule. You know, when I say that this is okay, in general, we're talking about patients like the, the picture on the left. You know, they got a Chiari, it's real, but they don't have a great big cervical syrinx. They're not incredibly symptomatic. Because I'm talking about the typical Chiari patient is, is how I feel about this. I have to say, I'd probably feel a little bit differently if somebody with this picture came to see me uh, for a, uh, for a pre-partum uh, consultation. Um, and, and if they were very symptomatic and had spinal symptoms and so on. But I think in general, that's true. I think I've got a couple minutes uh, left. Just to point out, I think this is reminiscent of advice I give people with respect to sports participation. So the, the peripartum advice is for the young adult Chiari patients. The sports, the question we get about the adolescents and the kids, it's all about sports participation. And it's the same sort of deal. Again, you look here in that JNS paper, we looked at a large group of people. We had about four and a half thousand sports seasons and we just basically split them out. Do you have a Chiari? Do you not have a Chiari? And we couldn't find any substantially increased risk of sports participation in the Chiari group. So I personally am very permissive when it comes to sports participation with Chiari diagnosis. But just like the pregnancy advice, you know, I have to point out that that four and a half thousand sports seasons was generally people like the picture on the left, okay? It's not people like the picture on the right. The people with the picture on the right are getting surgery. I don't let them participate in sports until they have a good looking scan three months after, after surgery, at least in my practice, that's what we do. So same thing with pregnancy. Left picture, yeah, fine. Right picture, I don't think that the data that I've shared with you today can really be um, said to really apply to people on that end of the spectrum. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but I can't prove that to you, and I'm not trying to suggest that to you. So there's an exception to every rule, but again, what I'm sharing with you today, uh, I think is, is general practice. So I really thank you for your uh, attention. It's been a wonderful meeting. Again, thank you to the organizers. Um, Eric, John, Patrice, Patricia, and, uh, and Dr. Slavin, of course, for hosting the meeting this year. It's, uh, it's a lot of work that I know all of you put into this, but it's, it's very appreciated by all of us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.